You are watching a recording of a training webinar about how to conduct a systematic review. This webinar series was developed by the Impact Research Programme in partnership with Cochrane Common Mental Disorders and Cochrane Global Mental Health. Welcome to our second session on meta-analysis. We've got Alexander leading today and I'm here to, to have a look at the chat questions. So Najma and I will be looking after the questions on the chat and we've got Nikki as well for, for admin support. All right, so let's do this. Um, just kind of like a brief recap. Uh, we have come a long way at this point. We defined a review question. We wrote a protocol and registered it somewhere. We did the literature search, um, we selected the studies, extracted the data, assessed the risk of bias, or the, did the quality assessment. And now we have our results and we need to synthesize them. Um, so what is a meta-analysis again, you may ask? Uh, as you might remember in our last session, we kind of like discussed how a meta-analysis is just a weighted mean where more precise studies are given more weight. And I said that you can sort of like picture it, if you picture it like the bigger studies or studies with a narrower confidence intervals have more weight, that is a, a good enough intuition because bigger studies uh, are generally more precise and more precise studies will have a narrow confidence in confidence interval. Uh, we also kind of like uh, said that uh, meta-analysis are a great fit for synthesizing results of systematic reviews. Um, and that usually the result of a meta-analysis is more precise than each individual study. Also meta-analysis allow us to study differences between studies results and we will see that today. And there are like two main approaches to calculating a meta-analysis. There are the fixed effect meta-analysis and random effects meta-analysis. Uh, and the, the difference, uh, there's a conceptual difference. So in fixed effect meta-analysis, the idea behind is that all studies are measuring the same underlying true value. And any differences between them is only due to chance. Um, and the meta-analysis tries to find that value. In random effects meta-analysis, the concept is that each study measures different underlying true values. So uh, the, there might be like an overall trend, uh, but uh, due to chance, not only chance, but also setting and population, et cetera, like multiple other factors, the true value of each individual study uh, will be slightly different. So the meta-analysis is just kind of like taking an average of those true values. Um, so that means that for fixed effect meta-analysis, it's a simple weighted average uh, where more precise studies uh, receive more weight. While in random effects meta-analysis, the differences between studies, what we call heterogeneity, and we'll see more of that later, that is added into the weighting formula. So it's baked in. Um, so that if there is a large heterogeneity, so if there are many, uh, a lot of differences between the studies, we'll get like a larger confidence interval of the meta-analysis. So just kind of like a, a brief example. So if we have like these three studies and we do a fixed effect uh, meta-analysis, this is our result. Um, and then if we just pull them apart so that there are, um, there's more heterogeneity, um, the meta-analysis does not change even if we pull them far apart while, and this is with a fixed effect meta-analysis. In a random effects meta-analysis, if they're all the same, so no heterogeneity, they're identical, the re results are identical to the fixed effect. But if we start pulling them apart with more heterogeneity, 
the random effects reflects that within a wider confidence interval. So here we see uh, that even with more studies, we don't get a more precise estimate because now we have heterogeneity into the formula. So which one to use? Um, I think this was more of a debate in the past. Uh, nowadays, the tendency is to kind of like be more on the random, uh, go for random effects by default. Um, but le let's go step by step. So as we have seen, uh, the fixed effects and the random e fixed effect and random effects methods, they differ conceptually. Um, so you want to you will have to justify if you use a fixed effect method, um, you want to need to justify that the underlying effect is the same for each study. And it is difficult to uh, justify that in many circumstances. Uh, so one scenario would, uh, that I've heard where it might be justified uh, would be for example, if you're doing um, the same clinical trial in the same conditions and with the same type of participants um, so that, yeah, the only differences would be due to um, uh, chance or, um, yeah. But most of the times um, you will be doing random effects meta-analysis. So just go there by default. Um, again, the decision should be made in advance um, and should be specified in the protocol. And in the past, um, when I started, there were some suggestions that you just kind of like look at the value of heterogeneity and if there were was a uh, little heterogeneity, you would go to fixed effect. Uh, and if there was heterogeneity, you would go to random effects. Um, this not now in the last past year, I think it's kind of like gotten more decisive. Uh, so the decision of doing a fixed effect or a random effects meta-analysis should never be made on the basis of a, a statistical test for heterogeneity. Uh, because this again would go against like the pre-specification of what type of analysis you will do in the protocol. So bottom line, use random effect meta-analysis unless you can give a very good justification um, that the underlying effect is the same or is expected to be the same. So um, any questions so far? in? Today's session, I will be stopping much more often. Um, I think because it can be a bit kind of like dense. Uh, so, oh, I see the chat box kind of like lighting up. So the question is, what is heterogeneity? All right, uh, that is a great question. Heterogeneity, we will kind of like go into more detail uh, further down the line, uh, but heterogeneity refers to how different the studies are between them. So if I go to... Sorry, that's the results of the studies, how different they are. Yes, exactly, sorry. Uh, so if we're looking at these, um, we see that the results of these three studies are very different. So there is more heterogeneity than in these three studies. Um, and here there's even more heterogeneity. So it's just like how, yeah, the variability in the results. Yeah. It's a measure of inconsistency. Um, so there's another question um, which says, it seems that random effects is the safer option. Is there any disadvantage of using random effects over fixed effects at all? 
Um, and uh, um, wondering why you would ever consider using fixed effects because there's always some heterogeneity present in studies. Okay, to the, for the first question, um, yeah, random effects is, I would just go there by default. Uh, you really need to know how to make a case for fixed effects. Um, the disadvantage is, um, or what could be seen as a disadvantage is that the confidence intervals of the meta-analysis uh, are wider. Uh, so if you, that might kind of like be something bad, but that's, that's what there is. I, I would not kind of like make a decision based on that. Uh, that's just like an effect. I of... think, sorry, go on. No, go ahead. I was going to say you alluded earlier that this used to be a huge debate and it sort of is, you know, it's almost a philosophical debate. I think that that used to be quite heated but I think people used to argue that if you if you don't if you think there is too much heterogeneity to um justify so there's too much heterogeneity that means that you can't do a fixed effect meta-analysis so why would you do a meta-analysis at all used to be one of the arguments if, if you're saying that your studies are too different to combine then why are you combining them but I think people have moved away from that, like you were saying, it, it is becoming a lot less of a debate. And I think going with random effects as a default, like you were just saying, is is usually the, the right way to go. Um, I guess the one exception would be if, if you know, you know, for example, if, if you were meta-analyzing -anal maybe outside of the context of a systematic review and you're meta-analyzing you know, results from a series of trials that you have conducted yourself, where you know that they are very, very similar. Um, and you you would, you know, you, you feel confident using a fixed effect. But I think for most systematic review meta-analyses, random effects is definitely the way to go. And that sort of relates to, to some of the other questions that have come up on the chat, because there is a difference between that. I know Alexander is explaining in a, in a later slide between uh, statistical heterogeneity and clinical heterogeneity. Um, so one of the questions was, does it matter if things are measured in a different way? Yes, that can contribute to the heterogeneity. Um, but I think you can always assume that there will be heterogeneity so um, you should you should speak to a statistician as you're developing your protocol and, and try and make that call in advance in the interest of transpar transparency and, um, you know, sort of, yeah, uh, prospectively making those decisions and reporting them. Um, there are, yeah, somebody is mentioning the I-square test on the chat. So... Mm -hmm. I know that's coming up in your slides as well, isn't it, Alexander? The ways of sort of formally measuring um, yes. heterogeneity. Yeah, so we can park that for now, I think. Yeah, so I see there are like plenty of questions uh, regarding heterogeneity. We will kind of like do a, a deeper dive into heter heterogeneity later on. Uh, I think for now, um, just being aware that heterogeneity refers to like the variability and the results of the different studies um, might be enough and no worries, we'll get into more heterogeneity later. I think Alexander, the slide you've got up is a good visual illustration of heterogeneity. Each of those studies have got different results and that is that variation between them. Think of that when you think of heterogeneity. Okay, so maybe I'll continue. So when we are going to do a meta-analysis, let's, let's talk about inputs and outputs. Um, I will be focusing on continuous data and um, dichotomous, uh, dichotomous out, uh, data, so binary data, because um, those are probably the most usual ones, uh, but 
nowadays you can probably do meta-analysis of anything. Um, so yeah, uh, you can do meta-analysis of rock cores or like almost anything you can do a normal analysis. Uh, you can probably do a meta-analysis, but let's keep to the basics. Continuous data. Uh, generally, uh, continuous data uh, refers to um, data that is like numerical, um, and we usually uh, use the mean difference or the difference in means uh, to compare the two groups. Um, there's also the option of like using changes from baseline. So if you have, so an example would be, for example, number of symptoms of depression, okay? Uh, so if a study has measured both like um, a baseline number of symptoms and then after the intervention, um, post-intervention um, number of uh, symptoms, then you can either in your meta-analysis, you can just uh, use the difference in the post-intervention values, or you could also use the difference in the values of change from baseline. So if the study looked at like the difference between post-intervention and pre-intervention in the two groups, and then you compare those change from baseline values, that would still be a mean difference. And uh, when it comes to a meta-analysis, it doesn't make much of a difference. You can actually combine both types. Um, under the hood or the actual calculations are made using the mean difference and its standard error. And this can be obtained if the study reports the sample size or, or the group size and the mean and standard deviations for each group. And this is usually the preferred way. Sometimes if they do not report in this detail uh, and maybe they will only report uh, mean differences and 95% confidence intervals, um, we can still use this information to then uh, calculate the mean difference and the standard error. Um, and then that will give us a mean difference so that the meta-analysis, the output will be a mean difference and 95% confidence, confidence intervals. They call the most data. So this is, for example, um, presence or absence, um, death or alive, um, event or non-event. Um, so for dichotomous data, the data can be uh, represented as risk ratios, also known as relative risks, um, as odds ratios, or as risk differences. Um, again, under the hood, uh, this is something that you will not have to do, but it's good to know that the calculations, uh, the software does the calculations using the log risk ratio, log odds ratio, or the risk difference, and it's standard uh, error. So it's not using the risk ratio itself, but it transforms it um, to the logarithmic scale. It does all the calculations and then reports back in risk ratios again. So, and we will see that later when we kind of like look at some examples. So if a study reports the number of events and non-events um, for both groups, or if they report the risk ratio, odds ratio, or risk difference and the 95% confidence intervals, we can then plug that data into the software and we will obtain our risk ratio, odds ratio and risk difference with its 95% uh, confidence intervals. 
Um, a few more notes. I wanted to add this slide. If you go to this website of the Cochrane Handbook, um, it goes into detail on like the more subtle differences between uh, odds ratio and risk ratio and also risk difference. There is a question about geometric means. How do you deal with those? I was gonna say, I think it, it works just like a mean because it's worked out multiplying all the values together and then taking the end through. Um, so I'm presuming it does, but yeah, perhaps we need a statistician to. So, okay, um, but there's a, a nice example also for the students. So what I would do in this case, because obviously we, we cannot know everything, I would go to the Cochrane handbook uh, and see what they say over there. That is sort of like the way to go to solve this type of questions. Let's move on uh, to some more practical considerations. Like how, how do you do a meta-analysis like hands-on? Uh, so there's multiple softwares nowadays that will allow you to do meta-analysis. Stata can do meta-analysis. I think SPSS can do meta-analysis. R can, of course, do meta-analysis. But we will be using um, a much simpler specialized software, which is Revman, uh, which stands for Review Manager. And this is software developed by the Cochrane Collaboration uh, to prepare and maintain reviews. So you will see this sort of like the Cochrane way of doing things is sort of like embedded in the software. It is user-friendly and probably most important, it is free <clears throat> so that everyone can use it. Um, as I said, it is designed for Cochrane reviews, but uh, we can use it for just doing the meta-analysis part. Um, you can download it for free at this link. Um, you can also find the user guide and there's some video tutorial you can find online. I also have to say uh, Cochrane um, is kind of like moving away from Revman or at least they have a new online version. Uh, but the downloadable version is still available for everyone who is not a Cochrane author. Yeah, can I just yeah. jump in there, Alexander, just really quickly. Um, the Revman web is the, the web-based version, which is at the moment only available to people actually working on a Cochrane review. So you can only access that with a review um, that is registered with Cochrane. So if you just want to use Revman to do your meta-analysis, downloading Revman 5 from the links that Alexander has given on that slide is, is your best bet. And it is free um, and you can export your, your forest plots and everything into Word. So stick with Revman 5 for now, unless you're working on a, on a Cochrane review. So um, I will be using some extra examples extracted from this uh, Cochrane review that I found. So once you start Revman the first time, when you open it, you'll get this welcome window. You can close it and create a new one welcomes you and we probably you probably will want to do an intervention review uh, you select the title uh, for example let's say exercise versus control for depression um, And this will be a full review. There you go. Organization of the software is like you have this tree of uh, sections and a main uh, window where you can see whatever you have selected with some tabs up here that we will see populating. Um, as I said, this software is meant to do like the whole review of a Cochrane review. Uh, so here you can actually write the whole thing. You have all the sections 
uh, of what will be your manuscript. Because we will be using right now Refman only for as a statistical software, we can just kind of like forget about that. And we will be kind of like more on this section. The first step will be to add the included studies. Uh, so we cannot do the analysis until we kind of like put in some studies in there. So for that, we go to studies and references. And if we click here, we can kind of like fold it down, uh, references to studies included studies. Again, you can see like all the data you, that you would want to include in a Cochrane review, but just for doing the analysis, we'll go to included studies. We right click and we add study. So from that Cochrane review that I mentioned before, I just kind of like extracted some data from some studies and, and that's what we will be working on, okay? Um, so I have data for Gary, 2010, Hemant Far, 2012, Hoffman, McNeil, etc. Alexander, just yes. sorry, sorry to butt in. Somebody is asking on the chat to to repeat the last step. All right. So you have to go to studies and references. Um, reference to studies, and then unincluded studies. You right click and add study, okay? So um, let's start with Gary 2010. Um, so at this point, you don't have to put in like the whole references. So this is just like an ID. And usually what we, the the um, we usually just write like the last name and a uh, year of publication and you can specify multiple other things uh, it actually picks up the year but you can just click finish um, and let's include some other more studies so Hemat Far, 2012. Finish. And Hoffman, 2010. So I will only kind of like show with a few studies how to input the data uh, and interpret the results. Uh, so Let's stick with those three. Once we have included the studies, it's time to define the comparisons and the outcomes in each comparison. So for that, we go to data and analysis. So now we want to kind of like make the meta-analysis. First, we need to specify a comparison. So in this case, we were comparing exercise versus control. All right. And then in this comparison, uh, we could be looking at different outcomes. Uh, so let's add an outcome. Here, we need to specify what type of outcomes. Uh, we are talking about continuous and dichotomous outcomes, um, but there are like other types of outcomes. Uh, for now, let's focus on continuous first, uh, because we will be looking at two, um, two outcomes, reduction in depression symptoms and uh, completed intervention. So um, let me just copy this and this is just like the label. So exercise. In this window, 
this is an important window because here's where you specify what type of analysis. So we make sure we click on random effects and the effect measure, um, we are selecting the mean difference. If the different studies we're using, for example, different measurement scales um, that are not directly comparable with each other, um, it is possible to use the standard standardized mean difference. Um, but I think that I thought that was beyond what we want to cover like in this first session. So let's stick to mean differences. And here you can kind of like do a little bit more setting up. So let me just move forward and finish. Excellent. So now we are in this outcome, in this comparison, in the analysis. As you can see, there's nothing happening here because what we need to do next is to specify which one, which studies of these three are reporting outcomes for this meta-analysis. So for that, we will now add study data. Um, and conveniently, all three uh, have data on reduction in depression symptoms. And now we get this grid where we can introduce the data. All right. So let's say uh, for Gary 2010, they found that in group one, the exercise group, the mean reduction in depression symptoms was of 8.4 with a standard deviation of 5.6 and uh, the group size was 20. So we could go to 8.4 and then what was this? 5.6 and 20. So this has many issues, what I just did. Um, because I'm kind of like, copying and typing it manually in here. This is not only very inefficient, but it also um, is prone to error. I mean, if you have, I don't know, 15 studies and you have to manually copy uh, 15 times six uh, values, it is easy to make any mistakes. And it's a lot of work, especially when you have multiple outcomes. So um, that is something you want to take into account when you're extracting the data. So in your form, when you're extracting the data on the number or on, on the reduction in depression symptoms, you don't want to have just a text field where someone writes this. Instead, you want to have each of this information to kind of like in different um, fields so that in the end you get something like this. So that when you, I don't know, when you export the form or uh, the Excel uh, file that you used, etc., that you can simply just copy and paste into Cochrane. So, that is easier said than done sometimes. Uh, because for some reason, um, the copy and paste would not work with Cochrane, with Reichman. Um, at least that's my experience. So it worked well now, but sometimes it doesn't. So just, um, I've noticed that if I kind of like close Reichman and open it again, then maybe that will work. So let's see if we run into that issue or maybe not. So now I can easily add him at far. I just copy. Um, I assume you're all aware with control C for copying 
and control V for pasting. Um, it's worth double checking that you're doing everything right. 22.8, 4.9, excellent. And Hoffman. Okay, so as you can see, um, while you input the numbers, uh, Refman automatically is already calculating the mean difference and the confidence interval and building the forest plot over here. You can get like a nicer view if you click on this icon um and there you have it let me just check my notes okay so that's with a uh, continuous outcome um i will now kind of like do another example with a dicotomous outcome um specifically with completed intervention. We have added this outcome. We have done our meta-analysis. Now let's add a new outcome. So this is the same in this under the same comparison. We will add a new outcome. And this time it would be a, a dichotomous outcome. Um, This is completed intervention. Okay. We have more options when it comes to statistical method. Um, by default, just go to inverse variance. There are some slight differences with Peter and Mental Hansel, but I don't think it's worth getting into that by now. Analysis model is a random effect. And here we can choose between odds ratio, risk ratio, or risk differences. I'll just go with odds ratio. Um, we can move forward and finish. There you go. So um, as you can see, Refman expects the data in this format. So it's an events total uh, and that for each group. Um, so again, first thing is to add the studies. Here you go. And now we want to make sure the order is the same and we can just like copy and paste. There you go. All right, and that is it with uh, Dichotomous data. Um, this is again very simple because all the trans so all the calculating the odds ratio, transforming into the log odds and then doing all the calculations. Um, uh, it does everything like under the hood. So in the end, we just get like our odds ratio and confidence interval, um, just as expected. So what happens, uh, I said that um, we can obtain the data either like if we get like the raw data, this is always better, but sometimes a study might not report the data in this detail, but they will only maybe report, um, let's say 0 0.3, the, the, the odds ratio with its confidence interval. So um, if you have that case, uh, you can still add it into uh, Refman but it is a little bit trickier um, because you will have to use the inverse variance method. 
So um, let's say, let me just copy this outcome and paste it and um, if instead of uh, selecting a dichotomous, we use the generic inverse variance. Um, yes. Okay. So now we've selected, instead of choosing dichotomous, we're using the generic inverse variance. Um, we're still kind of like, oops, we want to use the random effects method. Uh, and we are still interested in odds ratios. And the rest remains the same. Okay, so as you can see, when we switch from uh, the dichotomous to inverse, um, it kind of like erased everything. And right now, the options we have is you just, we just write the log odds ratio. So this is like the raw data that it will use. This might be a bit daunting, but uh, don't worry. Uh, Refman has you covered because it has this beautiful calculator, which will allow you, if you write the odds ratio and the confidence interval, it will automatically calculate the log odds ratio and the standard error. Um, I will do one example. So we know that uh, Gary 2010, odds ratio is 6.61 and uh, 0 0.3. All right, so it only needs one of the bounds of the confidence interval. It populates everything, you update the table, and you're good to go. So it's a bit more complicated, but in the end, quite simple to just kind of like um, do the meta-analysis if the data is reported as odds ratio and confidence interval. Unfortunately, um, if only one of the studies reports the data this way, you will have to do the whole meta-analysis this way. But if you do get a chance, I suggest that you download um, Revman and have a play with it just in the same way that Alexander was just doing now. Thank you for your, your time today and I will see you in two weeks. <laughs>